Good afternoon and welcome to Tuesday Topics. And today I really wanna focus on kidney failure and fluid resuscitation. And these two things are intimately, intimately involved and we don't really think about them very much. So I do wanna remind you about what your kidneys need. What your kidneys need is volume, pressure, and oxygenation. So that's a really important perspective, volume, pressure, and oxygenation. And in the absence of the adequacy of any one or all three of those, what we'll end up seeing is acute kidney dysfunction. Now, acute kidney dysfunction, important to remember, kidney depends on volume, pressure, and oxygenation. And acute, acute kidney dysfunction is characterized really by a sudden decline in glomerular filtration rate. Now, if you're in nephrology, if you're really in love with the kidney, you're gonna appreciate that glomerular filtration rate is the best way for us to evaluate kidney function. And we're so lucky. I think almost everybody on the phone here today is from Grady. And at Grady, we get a GFR calculation, a basic calculation. Now to do a full calculation, you have to look at serum urea, and serum and, uh, and urine urea and serum creatinine and urine creatinine, but we do get an approximated glomerular filtration rate. For the majority of us, we're not really following that. Most of us are looking at rate of rise in your serum creatinine. And that's a really important concept for us when we're thinking about our patients and how we're evaluating that. So very important for us to appreciate I, I really wanted to show you this design that I had made and I just couldn't find it. Just to remind yourselves that we separate the kidney into two parts. The first part is the glomerulus, which is a very high efficiency filter and it filters everything that gets placed in these little capillaries. And whatever goes through those capillaries gets gathered in a bowl. The bowl is the Bowman's capsule and the Bowman's capsule collects everything that's been pushed out of the filter. The filter, primarily depends on the volume and hydrostatic pressure of the volume in the vessel, pushing fluid across the high efficiency filter, bringing all sorts of solutes with it and falling into that bowl. And that bowl is the Bowman's capsule. And that bowl now is conducting what we call the filtrate. And that actually is communicating what's been passed out of the blood, what's been captured in the bowl, and it dives down in a tubule, ultimately the loop of Henle, into the middle of the kidney. Now, what happens in the middle of the kidney is we're going to use oxygen, and we use a lot of oxygen, but only deep in the middle of the kidney to actually mobilize electrolytes and ions and other products back into the blood and to get rid of things that are in the blood that we don't want. So, this is a really, really important because when we see failure to filtrate, this means that we have impending kidney disease. So for the majority of us, what we're going to use is rate of rise of creatinine. I'm going to show you a slide in just a moment. Okay. If your creatinine rises above four, which by the way, nobody should let their patients get that high. We need to act sooner but when it rises above four, you're actually in acute kidney failure or acute renal failure. Now, until about five years ago, there really wasn't a standard for evaluation kidney disease and kidney dysfunction. But now we have a standard that actually has been put forward by the Acute Kidney Injury Network and another group, a terrible name, Kidney Improvement with... Um, Diagnostic Group and Outcomes called CADIGO, CADIGO. It's a terrible name. I can never remember exactly what the letters stand for, but CADIGO and Aiken are sort of like the AHA and the ACC, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology for Heart, the Acute Kidney Injury Network, and the Kidney Disease Group uh, Improving Outcomes is the CADIGO group. So they are really helping us to define when we see early shifts in how our kidney is working. So this is known as the rifle criteria. It's been embraced by multiple groups, all critical care groups, the emergency physicians group, everyone has embraced this criteria, which is basic GFR criteria using creatinine 
and basic urine output criteria, okay? So really important to uh, see that sort of in that first step, that's risk, then injury, failure, loss, and end stage, so that's false rifle, that when we look at our patients early on and we see patients having a rising creatinine, we're going to say that patient's at risk. Their creatinine is rising, and it typically means that it's increased one and a half times the initial creatinine or around uh, uh, around 50 to 75% of the emission creatinine. That gets combined with the urine output looked at in mLs per kilogram per hour times six hours. So just in case you haven't heard me say this before, and there are people here who probably not heard me talk about the kidney much, because you might not be doing CRT, which is where I usually talk about the kidney. Really important to remember that just like you and I, our patients have a variability in their urine output. I don't go to the bathroom continuously every hour. I go to the bathroom every couple of hours and I make a bolus of urine output. So when we talk about our patient's urine output, we're going to look at an average over time. Now, from my point of view, and I've tried to get this appropriated in EPIC, I feel like EPIC should be doing at the end of your six hours and at the end of 12 hours, a calculation. That calculation takes the amount of urine your patient made over that time. So six hours is the lowest amount of time. 24 hours is the greatest amount of time. Looking at the amount of urine made over that time, divided by the hours of that time. So again, if you've done a six hour cal a calc, you're looking at six hours of accumulation of fluid. So I've made 300 cc's in six hours. Maybe one hour I only made 10 and maybe another hour I made 250 and then another hour I only made 40. But in six hours, I made 300 mLs. So now I take that 300, I divide it by the hours. So that says now my average was 50 mLs per hour because it was over six hours. And then I divide that further by my patient's weight in kilograms. And by the way, it requires a daily weight and an accurate weight. And what we know is that adult patients who've been adequately resuscitated, and when I talk about adequate resuscitation, I'm not just talking about fluid, I'm talking about inotrope, and I'm talking about vasopressors. So adequate resuscitation of a critically ill patient should equal a urine output of greater than 0 0.5 mLs per kg per hour. Anything less than that, indicate you have a patient who's at risk for renal disease. If that goes on for 12 hours, you have injured the kidney. If that goes on for 24 hours, and if it's less than three, you have kidney failure. Oh my God. Oh my God. How important is your output? Like such an incredibly important tool that we as nurses control, we collect your urine, we measure it. And measuring urine isn't eyeballing it, it's actually measuring the urine because every CC is really important. So one of the most vital things that a nephrologist will tell you, most intensive care doctors will tell you, at our hospital, many of our doctors have kind of thrown their hands up in you know, frustration. Accurate INO is one of the most important indicators when we're talking about our patients, because we can look at serum creatinine, but remember serum creatinine in and of itself is not diagnostic. It's serum creatinine plus urine output. So I want to make sure you appreciate this. If I increase my creatinine one and a half times, so my baseline creatinine was four, and now it is one. I don't meet criteria in the lab for abnormality, but I've increased my creatinine 1.5. 1.5 milligrams. And if my urine output averaged over six hours is less than 0.5 mLs per kg per hour, this patient's at risk for renal dysfunction. That means that me, the nurse, I'm now communicating, what am I trying to do to improve volume, pressure, and oxygen to that kidney? And then titrating up on a vasopressor does not naturally relate to improving kidney outcome. Giving patients volume does not naturally, naturally relate to improving kidney outcome. And putting patients on high flow oxygen does not naturally equate to improving kidney outcome. But I'm going to use this early indicator of risk by assuring that I'm collecting urine appropriately 
And by correlating that to an increase in creatinine, and then the creatinine increases times two. Now remember that, that so I said one and a half was one, but that was incorrect. So one and a half meant I went from 0.4 to 0.6. And now I've increased times two. Now I'm at eight, okay? Now my baseline creatinine is 0.8. And my urine output is less than five mLs per kilogram over a 12 hour period, my patient has kidney injury. I need to do something now, right? I don't want to wait. I don't want to just toodaloo loo along my way doing my same stuff while my kidney is injured and is deigned most likely to fail. When we look at kidney failure, creatinine has increased threefold. Urine output is less than 0.3 mLs per kilogram for a 24 hour period of time. Here, is where in general, you now will call for a nephrology consult, but your patient's already in kidney failure. He's already in kidney failure. So now whatever you're gonna do is to pull him back from the jaws of kidney failure, when in reality, it would have been best if we could have actually evaluated the patient at renal risk, which is a little harder, but it's not so hard at kidney injury. At kidney injury to actually identify that patient and then be all over what you're gonna to do to try to improve kidney outcome volume, vasopressor, inotrope, maybe all three, maybe just two. Our goal is to prevent you from having kidney failure. And quite honestly, uh, I was sharing with my class today in boot, cardiac boot camp, like my number one goal before I leave this hospital, I would like to see a reduction in about 50% CRT. Because if you're applying CRT here at Grady, you're already in renal failure. That's why we're giving you CRT. We're taking your blood outside of your body and applying the filter and the tubular function through our equipment. But that any patient who goes on CRT or dialysis, we've increased mortality 40%. That seems really important to me if we hold this strongly in our hands and we appreciate and understand it to really try to pre prevent acute kidney disease in our patients. So absolute numbers are not known. But what we do know is that at least 70% of critically ill patients at any time in any hospital experience some degree of acute kidney disease. And that about 5% of those patients in the ICU receive renal replacement therapy. Now, I would tell you here at Grady, what I'm looking at statistically with our CRT devices is that we're doing about 15% of our patients who are critically ill receiving renal replacement therapy, 15%. And then Look at that grim, dismal number. 40 to 80% of those patients who receive renal replacement therapy are going to die. Okay, so I want to make sure we always pull back. You know, everything I talk about is always connected to everything else. It may not always seem that way, but I want to be sure we're always pulling back here and saying, let's not confuse maintenance of amino arterial pressure with good blood flow and good oxygen delivery. They're not the same thing. And in the pursuit of blood pressure, we often actually harm our patient's organs. And I think there's nowhere else that this is more important than the kidney. When we look at how the kidney responds to volume, to volume overload, to vasopressor and vasopressor overload. Now it's important to appreciate the different types of kidney injury and kidney dysfunction. So I'm gonna just talk about the categories and I wanna talk about them really quickly, okay? The most important category, which is the number one category that causes or promotes acute kidney disease in our critically ill patient is the individual who has a problem that is before the kidney. It doesn't mean pre-renal failure. It means your problem is before the kidney. You have renal arterial disease, you have profound hypotension, and you have significant hypovolemia. Now, you can have hypotension, hypovolemia, that is arterial, even in the face of having high veno volume overload. So particularly in heart failure, we can see patients have a lot of volume in the vein, a lot of volume in the interstitium and the pulmonary interstitium, the pulmonary vein, but they're arterially hypovolemic. I believe if every single critical nurse would take a shift to say, when my patient is arterially hypotensive and veno volume overloaded, there's a problem in getting the volume to the arterial bed. And I'm going to discuss that with my provider. Your provider might say, what are you talking about? You've been to too many conferences. Why are you so smart? When did you go to medical school? They might say all sorts of things. They might also say, thanks so much for the suggestion. I, I can't tell you and I can't predict it. I only know that when we have patients who are arterially underperfused and hypotensive, the first thing you're going to do is try to get that blood pressure up. And yes, you're going to get vasopressors, but that is a band-aid. 
And when you go from zero to 20 or zero to 40 in the face of five minutes, you actually can promote very significant renal damage. When you give aggressive volume resuscitation and you don't have a targeted endpoint, and by the way, the endpoint is not mean arterial pressure, but if you don't have a targeted endpoint, you can volume overload your patient. When you volume overload the patient, they actually end up with arterial <laughs> underload. So really, really important for us to appreciate that and to remind ourselves that the number one cause of acute kidney disease in our emergency department in our ICU here at Grady is pre-renal. Systemic hypotension, severe hypovolemia, and renal arterial disease. That's the most common form, and typically that's something we can do something about, right? If you've necrosed the tubules, those are the oxygen-dependent surfaces. They're necrotic. They're infarcted. We're not going to get much restoration. But when you have pre-renal dysfunction, if I have a really great advocate and a really great provider, I may be able to protect the patient from acute kidney injury. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And there's a lot of overlapping between this. If I have sustained pre-renal dysfunction, I'm hypoperfused because I'm hypovolemic, I'm hypotensive, I'm hypoperfused, I'm going to end up infarcting my tubules. So I go from pre-renal to intrarenal. Post-renal typically is obstruction of the outflow ureters from my bladder, I mean, from my kidney to my bladder, and obstruction there can occur because your patient's got a stone, but that's not usually what we see. Usually what we see, by the way, is our beautifully over-aggressive volume resuscitation promoting neck vein distension, interstitial volume load, a chest x-ray that's wet, and by the way, something you're not actually evaluating until it's really late. And that is extravasation of volume in the abdominal vault. Once you have extravasation of volume in the abdominal vault, we'll call that abdominal hypertension, whether you're measuring it or not. And I'm not advocating everybody gets a measure. But once you have intra-abdominal hypertension and you, you're there because like maybe you came in really shocking in the ECC, you got four liters of volume, you went to the OR, you got two more, you get to the ICU and 24 hours later, you've gained nine kilograms and there's volume in your vein and your interstitium. I'm seeing the volume in your lung by your chest X-ray, but what I'm not recognizing is the volume in the lung on a chest X-ray from someone who's from volume overloaded also represents the volume in the cerebral vault. And I'm not measuring your ICP because you're not a neuro patient. I'm not paying attention to that, but your ICP is up. Your abdominal pressure is up. And when your abdominal pressure is up, that's because you have fluid that's extravasating the interstitium, and now you're compressing the bladder. And the bladder is a hollow organ, which is why we measure bladder pressure to tell us about abdominal pressure. But if I have bladder pressure that's elevated, I have fluid in the abdomen, I am also going to compress the outflow from my kidney, which means I'm going to have obstructive renal failure. So I had pre-renal disease. I was hypovolemic. I was hypotensive. I got a lot of volume in the pursuit of trying to do the right thing. I got a bunch of vasopressors, but now I have a significant limitation of flow into the kidney. And that volume overload escaping out into the interstitium is promoting a form of compartment syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, pulmonary compartment syndrome, cerebral compartment syndrome. And that prolonged reduction of blood flow and pressure pushing blood into the glomerulus, which then reduces the blood flow that exits from the glomerulus and supplies oxygen to the tubes, you've infarcted your tubes. And by the way, not to add to that terrible insult, but because you have intra-abdominal hypertension, you are also obstructing outflow. So by the way, you're not making any urine. None. Now, I might go get a bladder scan, most likely in this scenario, pre-renal, intrarenal to post-renal, you're not going to have any, any urine in the bladder. But by the way, before you do anything else, no matter where you work, and you need to be sure that you all have bladder scan capability. I don't care where you work. I don't care who you are. In your units, ER, step down, ICU, you should have a bladder scan. Everybody needs to know how to use it. Because the very first thing I need to do when I see that your urine output is down, the first thing I need to do is actually evaluate, do you have urine in your bladder? Because the easiest thing I can do is get that 
to empty. And if I don't empty it, you will end up with acute kidney injury. Okay, so just really just generically, when we talk about measurements that we make in the lab, measurements that we think about, uh, really, really important to kind of separate pre-renal dysfunction, because remember, pre-renal means not appropriate volume in the arteries, not appropriate pressure, not adequate oxygen. Maybe you've got heart failure. You might have some other disturbances. You've got hypovolemic shock, hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, but something has interrupted the flow and volume and oxygen delivery to the kidney. Having that pre-renal measure is really, really important, okay? So I just wanna talk about urine measures and serum measures, okay? So what you're seeing here is looking at your urine, your urine typically with a pre-renal dysfunction, you are having very concentrated urine and typically the urine concentration is greater than 500. Now you have to have done a urinalysis for that. So let's say, let's say hopefully you did do a urinalysis, but maybe you didn't. Got to get one now. And then you're going to look at urine sodium. So most people don't actually know these data. They're pretty simple. You should never be wasting salt in your urine. Salt needs to stay in your serum. So when you see, when you're looking at that pre-renal dysfunction, you're gonna see that you're not wasting salt in the urine because you're trying to conserve your water. So you're retaining salt, you're returning water. The time that you're gonna have sodium in your urine is when you've infarcted your tubules. When you infarct your tubules, your tubules are responsible for maintaining your sodium. So you're gonna waste a lot of sodium in your urine. So if I, if I look at you and you're very concentrated and your urine sodium is less than 20, I'm like, Yahoo, you've got pre-renal dysfunction. I still have time to preserve your kidney. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do, okay? Now here, we're not looking at BUN or creatinine independently. We're gonna look at the proportional ratio. Now the glomerulus, which is really the victim of pre-renal disease, the glomerulus is responsible for clearing the majority of the BUN and the minority of the creatinine. So if I say that I have a patient who has a BUN of 20 and a creatinine of two, that's a 10, to one relationship, that would mean that the BUN creatinine ratio is 10. If I have a patient who has a BUN of 40 and a creatinine of one, that's a 40 to one relationship and their BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 20. It's actually 40. Now, a wide ratio. So all you have to do, right? You didn't even measure the urine. You don't know anything about the urine. You just get the BUN and the creatinine on your chemistry. It does give you a ratio and it's just the BUN divided by the creatinine. If your ratio is greater than 20, your patient's not making much urine. He seems pretty unstable and his creatinine has increased while his urine output has gone down. You still have time to resuscitate his kidney. That's up to you, my friends. Only you can prevent kidney failure. BUN and creatinine ratio greater than 20. This is a really important criteria because it tells us that we may still have time to preserve the kidney. Now, everything else I'm going to talk about here. So I talked about the osm. I talked about the so urine sodium. The other thing is urine creatinine. Okay, urine creatinine normally because the glomerulus is responsible for cleaning a little bit of the creatinine, but your tubules clear a lot. So you expect to see urine creatinine greater than 40. When your tubules are infarcted, that creatinine is going to drop because now your tubes aren't clearing the creatinine, right? And then I'm going to just, I'm going to just talk about, there's a proportional ratio. We really don't use that much here. That's the urine to serum osm. And that's a really important thing because it tells us about the fact really with pre-renal failure that you've got really, really, really concentrated serum. Okay. But the last thing I'm going to, just discuss. You're not necessarily going to look at this, but your nephrologist will always talk about it. If they think you're interested, they'll always talk about it to you. This is called the fractional excretion of sodium. And it looks at how much sodium is in the serum, how much sodium is in the urine, and the creatinine in the urine and the creatinine in the sodium. And it just tells us about percent extraction. It's the most important uh, component of diagnosis here. If I have a phena of less than one with concentrated urine and a wide BUN creatinine ratio, that is pre-renal failure. Why do you care about this? No, you don't need to make everybody's diagnosis. You just don't, you're okay. You don't have to diagnose your patient. What you have to do is recognize that you still have time 
to prevent renal dysfunction. When you have pre-renal dysfunction, you've got time to resuscitate the kidney. And even if you're doing the greatest resuscitation in the world, doesn't mean you're always going to be able to resuscitate the kidney, but to not be paying attention to this in the most acute population that we are all walk, working in, I think is not, not great. So we really want to look at these attributes of pre-renal failure. Now, remember, intrarenal, you've already infarcted the tubules. Either they've been destroyed by poisons like medication or the patient's uh, hemoglobin or, or uh, globulin proteins that have been released when the patient is uh, lysing their muscles. That's rhabdomyolysis. So lots of times we, we don't have that much opportunity once you have nephrotoxic renal failure or ischemic uh, tubular necrosis. What we have is the recognition here and paying attention to this so that we can try to promote better resuscitation. So by the way, I think it's really important to have a good resuscitation endpoint. I think having renal criteria is a really great way for you to look at resuscitation, but they're somewhat delayed. So they're not telling me in the moment whether I've resuscitated you or not. You know, uh, if you read any literature and you've read any literature really in the last four to six years, mean arterial pressure, although it's what we use and no one's saying don't use it, I'm not saying that, but mean arterial pressure has really lost favor amongst hemodynamicists. Everybody who really cares about blood flow and blood pressure and blood volume is really interested in stroke volume. And all the literature today, everything you look at talks about stroke volume as a targeted endpoint for resuscitation. So I'm gonna take stroke volume, I'm gonna take CVP, I'm gonna take MAP, I'm gonna look at your heart rate, and I want to actually be tracking and trending my indicators of kidney function because that is going to really give me advice as to what direction I'm going and is what I'm doing actually assisting my patient in terms of resuscitation. Okay, so I just want to remind you about this resuscitation criteria. Now, this data was from 1996. Unfortunately, it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. So I'm just going to tell you that it's now a seven-time greater chance of death when you have acute kidney disease in a critical care unit. When you have acute kidney disease, seven times increase in mortality. That's pretty significant. So I want to remind you the abundance of our population have the big trio of kidney dis disease, the big trio, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. That comorbidity even though we can factor it into the variable that is profoundly significant in actually exacerbating acute kidney uh, dysfunction and particularly in critical illness when, again, not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's not enough for you to only look at mean arterial pressure. You have to actually assure that your ventricles are accepting the volume you give it and ejecting it. If you don't look at some measure of ventricular efficiency and ventricular ejection, and you're just giving volume, you're just giving vasopressors, and you're not paying attention to that, you actually can significantly worsen your patient's kidney function. So historically, we talked about risk factors for acute kidney disease in the ICU, and here are the big three, hypovolemia, hypotension, and sepsis, okay? Now, this is historic. Today, we're going to talk about a little bit more than that, but these are still really important cornerstones of acute kidney disease. And also we just see that in an evolution of multi-organ dysfunction because by the way, you had hypovolemia, hypotension and sepsis, and now you have multi-organ failure, multi-organ dysfunction. And then of course, anybody who comes to us who's critically ill, who already have pre-existing disease, and don't forget the significant and intimate complex relationship of the heart and the kidney and the cardiorenal syndrome and the liver and the kidney and hepatorenal syndrome. So again, opening our eyes, if you've got a cardiac deficit, probably likely that you've got some renal dysfunction. If you have a liver dysfunction, it is probably likely that you have some kidney dysfunction. We're gonna open our eyes. So yeah, maybe you work in the CVSU, you're in love with the heart, your patient still has all these other organs that have this intimate complex relationship. I'm working in trauma and I'm really concerned about your open abdomen and the fact that you lost four liters of blood on the street. I'm still looking at hypovolemia, hypotension, sepsis, and those existing co-relationships. And by the way, when the liver fails under your care, 
the kidney is not far behind. When the heart fails under your care, not because of anything you did, you're all trying to do the best you can, but when the heart fails under your care, the kidney is not far behind. And did you know that the most highly linked disorder to kidney failure in an ICU is ARDS? An ARDS that's volume overload ARDS, particularly. So we're gonna think about all these things as we hang fluids and as we hang vasopressors and as we hang inotropes, because our job is not just to titrate and write down numbers and just try to get to a mean arterial pressure. Our job is to try to resuscitate the organ and protect the organs from dysfunction. Now, other things that can happen, of course, diabetes puts you at risk for a very significant reduction in the lumen of your vasculature and making your vasculature less, uh, less uh, malleable, you know, to dilate and constrict as appropriate because of vascular disease and glycogen, de uh, glycogen deposition. Also, any exposure to nephrotoxins, and just a very short list of drugs, and this is not every drug because almost every drug you give actually can cause kidney dysfunction. Nephrotoxins means that they destroy the tubules first and the glomerulus works effectively for a while, but eventually the glomerulus will stop. So your patient will make a lot of urine, but it's gonna be really bad urine and they're not gonna be clearing creatinine. That's why you have to look at those two things together, right? Look at ability to clear creatinine and your ability to make urine. So with nephrotoxic kidney failure, that problem is that the tubules of the kidney but your glomerulus is still filtering and it's filtering just indiscriminately. So patients will make a lot of urine. Sometimes you refer to this as high output, uh, high output renal failure or high output kidney failure. It's high output because it's been targeted at the tubules, which are incredibly important and oftentimes are relatively hard to resuscitate. Okay. So what I want to convince you of in the short time I have left, because really is like another 10 minutes, I want to convince you about three phases of fluid resuscitation and how important they are in terms of kidney function. Resuscitation, which means your initial resuscitation for today, for today, maybe not forever, but for today, we're still gonna follow initial resuscitation guidelines, which is rapidly, if you're hypotensive, tachycardic, hypovolemic, we're gonna give you 20 to 30 mLs per kg as your initial fluid resuscitation. We're not gonna do that as 999 on the pump. We're gonna do it under a pressure bag because we wanna get that fluid into you really fast. But after that first resuscitation, so typically uh, that's at the first presentation of shock. So it doesn't mean you're in the ER, you could be in the ICU, but at your first presentation of shock, I'm gonna give you 20 to 30 mLs per kilogram, unless I have an extraordinary reason not to, which would be class four heart failure, or uh, if, if I have actual renal failure, I'm not going to give you that amount of fluid. I'm not going to give that to you even for early resuscitation. But after that initial volume bolus, I have to step back and say, what is my target? And my doc is probably going to say, I, I need the mean arterial pressure at 65. That's the target. No, no, no. I mean, yes. Okay. Fabulous. But that's not what I'm asking about. I'm asking about a target for fluid a target for fluid. And I wanna remind everybody that every fluid, every bit of fluid you give must be accepted by the ventricle and ejected from the ventricle. And if I'm giving you fluid and staying in your veins and it's out in your interstitium, it has not been accepted by your ventricle and ejected by your ventricle. So more fluid, not gonna make you better. More vasopressor is gonna make the problem worse. So I have to really open my mind to what it is I wanna talk about and suggest. I'm telling you everybody's gonna listen or appreciate it. I'm telling you that you're standing at the bedside, seeing a patient who is not making urine, whose serum creatinine has gone up, who is hypotensive, who has wet lungs and a wet system, but a dry arterial bed. And what that really means to you about what you're gonna do next. Because first I gave you fluid, but it didn't necessarily make you better or it made you better for a few minutes or 20 minutes. But then I start to see it extravasating and the neck veins are distending and it's out in the interstitium. And I'm having to increase your FIO2 because your lungs are getting worse. Gotta think about what we're doing when we're taking care of these patients and where that fluid is going. So there's a lot of discussion about phaseology and fluid therapy. First resuscitation, still 20, 30 mLs per kg, step back, because now 
we're going to actually evaluate your targeted endpoint to assure that the fluid I'm giving the patient is headed in the right direction. Every single phase here, resuscitation, homeostasis, and the big one, preventing fluid overload. Now, if you've been around Grady for a while, 15 years ago, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, we gave fluid like nobody's business. You would get four, five, six, seven liters of fluid. You were hypotensive, you get so much fluid. And then we recognized that we were actually causing volume overload, which is every bit, if not more dangerous than volume underload. And that's really the purpose of our discussion right now. So talk about what that means when we're, give, when we're overloading our patients with volume. Every single phase, so early resuscitation is the only time that you should be doing aggressive fluid resuscitation without a target, right? So a patient comes into the ECC, I don't really have an A-line, I don't have a CVP, they're hypotensive, tachycardic, hypoxic, I'm going to give them fluid, I'm going to give them 20 mLs per kg, great. But by that time, I need some lines and I need better data because I need to actually have a targeted endpoint now to actually uh, direct my fluid therapy towards goals. And the goal early on is keep the patient alive. And then the goal after that is maximize ventricular efficiency and minimize venal volume overload. We now know that when you're with 5 to 10% volume overloaded, that correlates to a significant increase in mortality and morbidity. One of the trials that we did here, the FRESH trial, and I was really fortunate to be one of the co-PIs on that trial. Andre Holder is a medical pulmonologist. Uh, he was our primary PI, and I was a co-PI. Brooks Moore was a co-PI from the ECC. Uh, Gloria Westney from Morehouse was a co-PI. And we looked at goal-directed fluid resuscitation versus standard care, usual care. In every single category except for two, the usual care patients proved to be significantly and profoundly, in terms of numbers, significantly and profoundly worse. They were longer stay on ventilator. They needed CRT more. They were longer stay in the hospital. Less percent of them were discharged home. Okay. There were only two categories where the numbers were bigger in the intervention, which meant the targeted fluid resuscitation. The first one was number to discharge home. 150% greater patients got discharged home who got moderated fluid resuscitation instead of aggressive fluid resuscitation. The other thing that happened, which was really interesting to me and a little bit surprising, but not completely unexpected, is that patients who had restraint with targeted driven fluid resuscitation, patients who had restraint had an increase in their serum creatinine, which resolved. They did not require renal replacement therapy, but they did have a bigger increase in serum creatinine during their hospital stay. Length of stay on vent, 50% decreased. Length of stay on vasopressors, 30% decreased. Unbelievable. And sometimes we don't think about that because we're just trying to keep the patient alive and then we're going to trade them off to someone else. The OR tries to keep them alive and they send them to the ICU. ECC tries to keep them alive to send them to the cath lab or the ICU. But you know, we're, we're really all a team, not just an ED team and a CV team, not just an ED team and an SI team. We are all on that same team and that team is on the patient's side. Uh, not appreciating how far we've evolved in the last five years in understanding fluid balance. That fluid balance is the single most important thing that we can apply to our patients to try to recover their organs, to try to protect them from severe and profound injury from fluid resuscitation. And that's why we have to remind ourselves that fluid is a drug. Doctors order it, nurses take the order off. They get it from, sometimes they get it from the pharmacy, the pharmacy or the value chain, which are supplying your fluid, it's a drug. And it's important to remember that it has a toxic cumulative effect. That when I'm three days in the ICU and 15 kilograms heavier, I'm 15 liters fluid positive. Where is that fluid? It's not in my arteries or I wouldn't be critically ill. It's in my lungs. It's in my abdomen. It's in my brain and it's in my interstitium. 
So my patient needs more PEEP, he needs more oxygen, he's got to be intubated, he's going to stay on the ventilator longer, he needs CRRT. Oh, we're lucky we have so many resources, but why are we getting to that point so egregiously and so often? Because we're not really thinking about this bigger relationship. Okay, so I want to remind you, first phase, I'm not saying really for, for us to change that, okay? So, you know, we think about historically what we look at in goals of resuscitation that we're always trying to restore organ perfusion. So end organ perfusion means are my tissues receiving an adequate supply of blood carrying oxygen? So by the way, achieving end organ perfusion with fluid, I'm sorry, unless you're hypovolemic, probably not the thing that's gonna make you better because A, fluid doesn't carry oxygen and B, fluid increases hydrostatic pressure. When hydrostatic pressure goes up, your capillaries distend, you lose the effectiveness of the capillary wall and that fluid moves into the interstitium. So almost universally, crystalloid, crystalloid and 5% colloid solutions, that just makes your interstitial edema worse causes disruption of the endothelial barrier and causes systemic edema to be worse. That's why the measures that we historically have looked at, mean arterial pressure, CVP, mixed venous saturations, even adequate cardiac output, those are not dynamic endpoints and they don't really predict what's gonna to happen to our patient. So I just wanna remind you, thinking about the fluids that you're giving. So you're giving crystalloid, whether it's balanced or unbalanced. Balanced crystalloid is lactate ringers and plasma light. Unbalanced crystalloid is sodium chloride. We call it unbalanced because sodium and chloride separate into sodium and chloride in vivo. Chloride is renally destructive um, and sodium actually causes problems with your red cell deformability. So in general, generally we would prefer overall never to give sodium chloride in fluid resuscitation. But if your patient is dying, that's what you've got on hand, you're gonna give it but you're not going to give it after those first 20 mLs per kg. you got to get something else. And that's why you get ringless lactate or you get plasmoid. Now, all three of those are crystalloids, right? All crystalloids are going to move into the interstitium. All crystalloids increase hydrostatic pressure. When you increase hydrostatic pressure without increasing oncotic pressure, you are going to cause glomerular failure of the kidney. So we have to think about that. I'm not saying, oh, doctor, I'm not giving that fluid. It's going to cause kidney injury. I'm going to say, I'm going to give this fluid, but I'm going to be cautious about it. And every time I give fluid, I want to redetermine my targeted endpoint to make a good decision about what I'm resuscitating. And I want to stop giving fluid when my patient doesn't respond. So I just want to remind you that for every 250 to 500 cc's of fluid that you give your patient, you have to. I don't know why we're not more aggressive about this. You have to measure a targeted endpoint. And that endpoint, <clears throat> which measures ventricular efficiency, is going to be stroke volume. That's what measures it. So, <coughs> excuse me. Hang on. <coughs> My throat is just dry because I've been talking all day. So when we look at ventricular efficiency, what we always want to remember is the best measure we have at the bedside <clears throat> that we can look at continuously is stroke volume. Not stroke volume variation, guys, stroke volume. So what I'm trying to evaluate when I'm looking at stroke volume is when I give you volume, can your ventricle eject it? For every 250 to 500 cc's of fluid I give you, you should increase your stroke volume 10%. You don't increase your stroke volume when I gave you volume. The likelihood is volume isn't the answer for you. You need something else. And that should be when we actually stop and say, should I continue to give volume to this patient? Okay. It's a hard decision. You have a patient who's in front of you and they've got volume overload. They've got AKI, but you're trying to achieve fluid homeostasis. You're trying to improve oxygen delivery. You want to give volume but the more volume you give this patient, the worse they're gonna get. So here's the thing. It'd be great if we could avoid more than 5% volume overload. That means you're not gaining you know, five kilograms. 
if we could avoid volume overload at the best, just by looking at simple daily weights and looking at really good eyes and O's and collecting urine, that could help us to really appreciate how our patient is doing. But what we also have to consider is that for many years, we're using a target of mean arterial pressure and mean arterial pressure is not a measure of ventricular efficiency. It is a correlated pressure measurement that is a combination of the fluid that's in the vessel ejected by the left ventricle and the vascular tone. It does not actually give us good information about ventricular efficiency. Every drop of volume I give you should end up in your arteries. Every drop of volume that I give you should improve your stroke volume. If I can maintain and sustain your stroke volume, if I have to add a vasopressor and maintain your pressure, great. But if I'm using vasopressors while you have a lousy stroke volume, I'm actually contributing to your failure. I really want to think about this when I talk about kidney resuscitation, volume resuscitation, and to remind myself very importantly, 50% of unstable ICU patients do not need volume. They're volume refractory. Only 50% actually are volume responders. And when we give volume to someone who is fluid refractory, we actually significantly and profoundly affect their comorbidity. We might not see it because they were in our unit, now they're somewhere else. We might not see what happens when we've been aggressive with our fluid resuscitation. I just want to talk a little bit. This is a SARS-CoV picture. Uh, I used it in my COVID talk about kidney injury. But what I want you to focus on here is not SARS-CoV. I want you to focus from here on down. Whenever you have hyperinflammation, so you have sepsis, you've had trauma, you've had a surgery, you've had an MI, you're hyperinflamed. So you have multiple things that happen when you're hyperinflamed. First of all, you have this storm of inflammatory agents. Those are known as the cytokines. The cytokines actually cause damage to the endothelium. Like neutrophils roll along the endothelial wall and cause opening. And if I add into that aggressive fluid resuscitation, driving up the hydrostatic pressure, all that fluid is going to come out of the vessel into the interstitium. And it's going to do it at the lungs. It's going to do it at the heart. It's going to do it at the brain. And it's going to do it at the kidney. And in fact, the kidney is one of the organs that is most susceptible to aggressive hyperinflammatory changes in the lining of the endothelium plus aggressive over volume resuscitation. So very important to understand this yin and yang here is that I have to make sure you have adequate volume without causing venous congestion. So the very first day that you see neck vein distension, the very first day that your patient has gained a kilogram or two kilograms in your ICU, that very first day, you need to appreciate that your patient now has venous congestion. Venous congestion profoundly affects kidney function, so profoundly causes deterioration in kidney function. You have to pay attention to two things that you are in charge of. Adequate, accurate, rigidly accurate I and O and daily weight. And I'm just not okay to hear any of this stuff about beds don't work. If your beds don't work, get them fixed. That is never enough to say that you've got a critical patient who you are value resuscitating and you don't have a weight because that is gonna be one of the best predictors of impending kidney injury. Gotta fix your beds, need a troubleshooting with the bed workshop so we all understand how to fix our beds and how to make sure that we are weighing patients same time every single day. We are in charge of that as nurses. Daily weights, adequate, adequate and rigorous INO every single hour. Unacceptable in a critical patient to say every two or every four, that is unacceptable because the difference between one hour and the next could mean the difference between renal function and renal dysfunction. So I've got to make sure I'm doing those things. Now, I want to remind you, there's this big link between the lung and the kidney, and it's pretty significant. So we know, uh, so we've had lots and lots of great studies that look into fluid resuscitation. 
an evaluation, particularly in patients who have ARDS, really thinking about ARDS and our resuscitation of our patients, looking at um, a central venous catheter, looking at stroke volume, looking at stroke volume variation in those studies, and really talking about whether or not patients needed fluid and organizing that fluid relationship to understanding that the lungs are predictors of the kidney. Really, really important. So we're, we have a lot of conundrums at our bedside of our critically ill patients. When we look at lung support, and remember that the lung is the canary of the kidney. Where the lung goes, so will follow the kidney. So we think about patients that we want to give fluid resuscitation to. And when we're thinking about that fluid, we need to actually be thinking, no matter where you work, you're in the CPR room in ECC, you're in the uh, critical care area in the ECC, you need to be thinking about why am I giving you a fluid? And that fluid needs to be considered positive and appropriate if my patient's ventricles can accept it and eject it, which means you're looking at stroke volume or at the very least cardiac output, okay? You don't see the word blood pressure anywhere here. That's because blood pressure is not a great indicator of whether or not your patient is gonna to respond to fluid, or whether or not they're refractory, okay? Now, as soon as I intubate a patient, put them on positive pressure ventilation, it's gonna be harder for the right heart to eject. So we are gonna think about giving some fluid to help the RV overcome that positive pressure. But we also have to remind, oh, yep, here's the word blood pressure, sorry. Just reminding myself that I wanna see the augmentation of your cardiac output and your stroke volume when I give you fluid, because that is gonna be the best way for me to assure that you have adequate renal perfusion. If I withhold fluids without having a target, so that's the point, to have a targeted endpoint. Because if I withhold fluids, well, Barbara said, don't give too much fluid, so we're not gonna give fluid. Well, the problem is if I don't give you, if I don't give you fluid, right? I can cause a lot of other disorders. I can cause significant disorder of your cortical um, lining. And really the reason we're gonna say that we uh, here, we're gonna withhold fluids because you've already got this problem, right? So sorry. So you already have alveolar flooding, your chest x-ray looks poor, I don't wanna give you fluid. You've got venous congestion because you are not a fluid responder. Okay, now a non-fluid responder, this is so important. A non-fluid responder is somebody who I give fluid to and their neck veins descend, their CVP goes up, but their stroke volume doesn't improve. They are not a fluid responder. But by the way, that's a patient who needs an inotrope. He needs help moving his fluid. It's really straightforward. Now, if they've got all that fluid, it's in the vein, it's in the interstitium, it's compressing the arteries and compressing the organs, et cetera, you're gonna see significant deterioration. So once our patient looks like he's fluid loaded, we're gonna withhold the fluid, but remember, we don't wanna withhold the fluid without really having a good idea of what our target and our endpoint is. So I wanna remind you, it's one minute before five, so I'm gonna end here, but I, I do have other things I'd like to share. and Hopefully you'll come back next week and I'll share more. Um, I do wanna remind you that when we look at administration of volume, we are always considering that what we want to do is that we want to improve oxygen delivery without causing significant and profound lung edema, interstitial edema, cerebral edema, abdominal edema, and renal cortex edema. So two things I'm going to leave you with here. Volume resuscitation does not improve oxygen delivery. Volume resuscitation increases hydrostatic pressure, which causes fluid flux. What you might commonly call capillary leak, fluid creep. Increasing hydrostatic pressure causes an increase in fluid flux. And fluid administration without a targeted endpoint can be profoundly damaging. I'm going to end that. I'm going to end today with that. I'd like to continue next week and invite you to return next week if you're able. I know it's a lot to ask you to take time out of your busy day. Next week, I'll be speaking at the European Intensive Care Meeting in Paris. Um, so we will have our talks at four o'clock. It will be 
11 o'clock my time. I'm going to have those talks. I invite you to join me. I'll be in Paris. Maybe I can have a picture of the Eiffel Tower behind me. Who knows? And I just want to, again, tell you how grateful I am that you come to class, that we're all learning together. You can't expect to understand and know everything I say immediately because I say a lot because I talk too much. And I'm really appreciating that you're willing to spend time together so we can learn together, we can improve our care, we can try to protect our patients and advocate for them. And I'm going to tell you that I thank you, thank you very, very much. And ta-ta for now. Please stay on for questions and answers. Thank you.